Good morning. Good morning, family. <laughs> How y'all doing? It's mighty good to see you today, and I just want you to know that I love you just like I, a fat kid loves cake, right? So, I hope everything is going okay in your lives, and you're not letting the negativity weigh you down too much, because it is a fight. Um, what's the little song Ayla, Layla um, McGee used to sing? Whoa, whoa, it's a fight in the morning. It's a fight in the evening. It's all right, but us, you know that it's a fight. And that's the truth. So try to stay above water, y'all. Um, and, you know, try to let your thinking get too stinking. Okay. Okay, now I brought y'all a story the other day and I talked about how nice uh, older people were generally nicer. And I think a lot of y'all said hogwash. So, <laughs> and I did too. Because basically, um, at the end of the day, I know uh, older people can get a little cantankerous. And we can be a little impatient. And we can be... Um, a little been there, done that type of mentality and attitude that makes it sometimes unbearable. Okay? Keeping it real and shaming the devil. Okay? So this story, I thought I, it'd just be fitting that I bring to you. Uh, because the wife, she's 66, and she stabbed her pain in the ass. Her ex-colonel husband, he was 78, she stabbed him to death. And threatened to cut off his penis. Um, she called the police three months earlier after they argued about how to use the remote control for his damn pacemaker. Oh my God. This relationship should have been absolved a long time ago because the hatred and the resentment was too high. And that's what you have to worry about sometimes in relationships when you've been in them a long time is that you hope that you're not resenting somebody to the point where you can be capable of doing something like that or you stand with somebody who is capable of doing something like this because they have resented you too much. She said he was a pain in the ass. Um, why she didn't leave, why this wasn't resolved and she felt it would be easier to just stab him to death and go to jail for the rest of her life. It's beyond me. Shit. Anyway, Penelope Jackson knifed her 78-year-old husband, David, three times in the kitchen of their bungalow on Somerset in February 13th of this year. The jury at Bristol Crown Court heard that she previously called the police in December 2020 after they had argued about the remote control for his pacemaker. She said his behavior was not so controlling in that he would stop her. Uh, she said, well, I'm sorry. She said his, his behavior was not so controlling in that he would stop her from seeing people, but they just described him as a pain in the ass. Now, what the hell? So she was free to leave. He wasn't trying to stop her from seeing people and stuff like that. And she said he was a pain in the ass. I think she was a pain in the ass. The pair were married for 24 years before the fatal attack earlier this year when Jackson told the 911 operator, I thought I stabbed his heart, but he hasn't got one. What the? Did y'all hear that? She said, I tried to stab him. I thought I stabbed him in the heart, but he don't have one. This nutcase. Well, okay. A pensioner who stabbed her husband to death had described him as a pain in the ass when she previously called police officer to come to her home. Penelope Jackson um, knifed him in, in, the, the, uh, in a bungalow that they shared for t uh, 24 years. My God. 
he grabbed me. She said, I've got bruises up my arms. He grabbed me and threatened me. I don't want to say any more. It's not like him. He's just mad. I can't explain it. Now, that was the Christmas call. During the call, Jackson said her husband had some, at some point, had the poker and told her, if you don't go away, I'll use it on you. Oh, my God. So Jackson went on to tell the operator, but he didn't mean it. She sure as hell did. The jury heard that Jackson was upset when police arrived at her home and that uh, she said he's going to be mortified and angry about what had happened. An officer told her the incident would be recorded as an assault and that the couple should not be under the same roof that night. On whether the matter should be taken further, with her daughter sitting beside her, Jackson said, part of me wants to make him pay, but that's just for spite. It's either we get through it or we get divorced. At the moment, I do not know how we get back from this. She said his behavior was not so controlling, again. And that he wouldn't stop her from seeing people. But again, he was just a pain in the ass. Jackson said he would say, I'm a control freak. And describe the situation as worrying, but that I have to deal with it for now. She admits that the manslaughter of the retired lieutenant colonel, but denies murder. Claiming that her husband was uh, caught. He was caught uh, orson and controlling and also physically violent towards her. Jackson said the attack on February 13th had been sparked by a row over a Zoom call. The defendant said her daughter Isabel had brought her and Mr. Jackson a gourmet meal for her birthday and that they had the daughter and son-in-law had eaten it over Zoom together. But the evening had turned sour following a, a row over the food and the call had, had to be ended. And she had gone to bed with a knife under her pillow for protection. Oh, I hate to hear that. I hate to hear that. Uh. See, because if you got time to put knives and shit up under a goddamn pillow to kill somebody, you got time to get the hell out of there. You don't need to have to kill no... You don't need to put no knife... What the hell? See, and this is what I'm saying. I've had people who have made me angry. I've had people who I haven't liked how they behave at all. And ultimately, I just had to get away from them. Uh, once I saw that it wasn't going to work. But never in my mind was I thinking about putting knives under the pillow or anything to kill them. That's your first sign right there that you sit and that you need to get away. See, so I don't have no excuse for this. No, I don't feel no kind of way for her right now. She, you know, this is some crazy shit. On the second day of, of Jackson's murder trial last week, the jury heard that the 78-year-old victim had been Jackson's fourth husband. Um, and she was his third wife. Okay? So, Sheila Taylor and Mr. Jackson's second wife told the court, her marriage to the victim had ended when he began an affair with the defendant in 1993. That's why his last wife left him. Mrs. Taylor told the court she had learned of the affair when Jackson rang their home and demanded to speak to their husband. See there? See, you know, he must have been turned on by, by that psychotic behavior. Um, she said she had been white and shaken when he came off the call, adding, he told me he had been having an affair with a woman called Penny, but the relationship was over now. Jackson didn't want the relationship to be over, and she was insisting he tell me about it and go to live with her. Mrs. Taylor said that after her divorce from the victim, after it had been finalized, he told her Jackson had threatened to do 
a Lorena Bobbitt on him if he ever tried to leave her. The alleged threat was a reference to a high-profile case back in the day, y'all, uh, when a woman cut off a man's penis and throw it in the damn woods somewhere. Mr. Jackson can apparently be heard screaming in pain after the 911 call in which he managed to get through before losing consciousness as the defendant drove a knife into him the final time. Jackson tells the call operator that she stabbed him because he thought I couldn't go through with it. Crazy bitch. That is sad. Because he thought she wouldn't go through with it. That's why she did it. She was detained by police who noted several injuries on both her arms and a small cut to her finger. The following day she was questioned, but the trial um, heard that she refused to answer them, instead providing a statement. She referred to the pacemaker incident in December 2020 when she called police after locking her husband in the conservatory to protect herself before he smashed his way out and assaulted her. Jackson described herself as a pragmatist and felt the situation was one where she would have to get over it or he walks. Nobody can make that decision but me. The situation had come out of the blue and Jackson had told officers that it may have been something to do with his Operation for the pacemaker battery replacement. The jury heard that a police violence abuse questionnaire in which was filled out by an officer who attended the scene said that Jackson had not felt isolated, depressed, or stalked. I mean, sometimes you can understand that, you know, when a person has a, you know, a history or um, not an excuse, but, you know, there's a history or tracker or a pattern of, you know, mental illness or something. But she was like, fine, no nope, one depressed. I just killed him. When the officer telephoned of her a few days later, Jackson said she and her husband had sorted out their problem and that he had turned the voltage on his pacemaker battery down after a call had been put into the hospital. He was back to his normal self and had no recollection of what had happened. At one point, she even pulled up the sleeve of her nightgown to show that a small round bruise was developing on her forearm before covering it again. When the police arrived, Mrs. Jackson was in another room in the house with his son-in-law and was told by an officer that he should spend the night with his daughter in Bristol. He insisted he did not mind being arrested. Earlier in the trial, Mrs. Jackson's daughter from the first marriage, Jane Craverly, said that the defendant found, found baiting people fun. She said that she had never seen the couple become violent towards one another, but noted that the defendant had liked making people feel uncomfortable and enjoying finding people's sore spots and poking at them. She said, it always seemed like he was on edge. My father was very particular. He didn't like to be shown up. When we were children, we were always told to behave properly because he didn't like to be the center of attention uh, because of our behavior. When he was with the defendant, he always seemed like he was on the edge. I always felt like I, um, everything had to revolve around Jackson. She was a very larger-than-life character. She would enjoy making people uncomfortable. It's hard to describe how Jackson and the victim interacted. It never felt comfortable. I never saw them argue, um, um, but Jackson would just bait him. It would result in an argument, and unnecessarily. 
Earlier in the trial, the jury were told how police found a confession letter with a pad when they arrived at the scene, to which it read, To whom this may concern, I have taken so much abuse over the years. Just look at my records. But he was a good daddy. However, the mask slipped tonight, and that was unforgivable. I accept my punishment. May he rot in hell. Mr. Jackson was pronounced dead in the kitchen of their marital home. Oh, my God. Near West Supermare, Somerset. Jackson denies murder, but admitted manslaughter. Slaughter. Tell me what y'all think about that. I mean, do y'all think that it would have been easier to leave? Or she sh should she have left? And what happens when you get to the point in a relationship where you just don't know how to stop, let go? Do you think that you should, you know, just end it this way? I mean, really. I'm waiting for y'all response. Thank you, family. And I'll see you in the next video. Damn.